Hi there. Welcome to Pigeon Point Light Station State Historic Park. My name is Joe and I'm the park interpreter here. Today, as a part of the Victorian Days virtual walking tour, I'm going to be showing you around the grounds of Pigeon Point Light Station, which you can see behind me. And we're going to be talking about the story of Pigeon Point to give you a brief history of how the light station came to be. Uh, Pigeon Point's story is one of tragedy, of hope, and of innovation. But before we begin, it is important to acknowledge that Pigeon Point Light Station sits on the ancestral land of the indigenous Kuroste Ohlone people. So this was a part of their home where they hunted, hunted, gathered, and lived. But Pigeon Point's story really begins with the California Gold Rush in the 1850s, 1849, 1850s. So as we probably know, in 1848, gold was discovered in Sutter's Fort near Sacramento. By 1849, thousands of people from all over the world were flocking to California and San Francisco, especially to become gold miners and try and strike it rich. Now, it's important to know that the way that people got here in those days was by ship. We didn't have cars, we didn't have planes, the Transcontinental Railroad hadn't been built yet. So the fastest and safest way to get to the West Coast was by ship. Because in fact, let's imagine that you were a person living somewhere on the East Coast or maybe even the Midwest. One option to get to the West Coast would be to take a wagon. It would take 150 days, you were at risk of catching disease, of being killed, robbed, tornadoes, other natural disasters. So that way it was out for most people. Uh, another option would be to take a ship down to Panama. The Panama Canal hadn't been built yet, so you would then have to trek across about 40 miles of swamp and jungle to the other side of Panama before you could get on another boat and then take that up to San Francisco. So that was too much work for most people because you also had to carry all of your stuff through that swamp and jungle. So the fastest, safest, and most reliable way would be to hop on a ship on the East Coast, sail all the way down around Cape Horn uh, at the tip of South America, and then up the western side. So prior to the gold rush, in the 1830s and 1840s, we had about 19 ships come into all ports in California, so hardly any at all. Most of them at that point would have gone into Monterey. That was the major port in those days because the bay was pretty easy, it was pretty large and accessible for ships to get in and out of. Now in 1842, kind of uh, as the gold rush is continuing to peak just before it starts to decline a little bit again. Uh, in 1852, there were over 1,100 ships that went into San Francisco alone. So you can just imagine the absolute volume of ships that are now suddenly coming up and down the California coast and into San Francisco Bay, which has a very narrow, very dangerous an, uh, entrance. It's quite easy to miss. So. In 1850, the U.S. Coast Survey begins going up and down the California coast, navigating the coast, and looking for places to build lighthouses. We'll talk about why a little bit later on and how lighthouses are used, but basically uh, they're there for ships to help navigate. It's a way for them to figure out where they are on the coastline. They pick about uh, 15 different spots to build lighthouses along the west, uh, along California. Unfortunately, Pigeon Point behind me was not one of those original locations for lighthouses. In fact, most of them were just sort of right around the San Francisco Bay entrance. So if you follow me, we'll move on and we'll talk a little bit more about why Pigeon Point Lighthouse specifically was built. So let's go. All right, so here we are at our next spot. As you can see right behind me, we've got a big piece of a shipwreck here. This is from the Point Arena, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Got the lighthouse behind me again as well. So as I mentioned at our last stop uh, in 1850, the U.S. Coast Survey began navigating the California coast and picked about 15 locations to build lighthouses. Uh, Pigeon Point was not one of them. Now what's important to know is that the California coast is especially treacherous for navigation. We've got lots of fog, lots of rain, lots of wind, we've got hidden rocks and breaker lines, so it's pretty easy for ships to get lost, it's pretty easy for ships to wreck accidentally, um, so it's a pretty treacherous stretch of coast for, for a lot of different ships. So. Although Pigeon Point wasn't built in uh, the original 15 lighthouses in 1850, uh, it wasn't until a few years later that uh, tragedy occurred. So in uh, 
early 1853, a brand new clipper ship called the Carrier Pigeon left Boston on its maiden voyage for San Francisco. It's a brand new ship, very, very valuable, um, very expensive to build, state of the line, state of the art. Uh, so it leaves, San Fr uh, leaves Boston on its way to San Francisco, successfully makes it all the way down around the tip of South America, and then back up the western side, completely fine, makes it around all those treacherous waters, and it gets uh, to about where we are right now. So they pass Santa Cruz, they're about a day away from their destination of San Francisco. They've almost made it. They've spent about 120 days at sea, about three months. So they are this close to the finish line. They get to where we are now at Pigeon Point and they get caught in an incredibly dense fog. The ship captain, unable to uh, navigate where he has been because he can't use the stars, he can't use the sun, they have to do what's called dead reckoning, which is basically estimating where you are based on where you've been. So you figure out uh, your compass direction and your speed, and then you use that based on where you've been to kind of get an estimate on where you are. But it's pretty easy for small errors to end up with large uh, consequences, essentially. So the ship captain hasn't been able to navigate properly for the last couple of days. They've been caught in some fog and then suddenly, uh, actually the ship captain thinks that he has begun to drift too far from shore. So they think they've drifted too far out west. So the ship captain orders the ship to be steered back east, closer to shore, hoping to catch sight of land when suddenly the ship is caught on the rocks, not 500 feet from shore here at Pigeon Point. So luckily nobody was killed in the wreck, so nobody died, but the ship was considered to be a total loss. So uh, it was completely wrecked. They salvaged what they could, but the ship was sold as is, so stuck on the rocks, for less than 2% of what it was originally valued at. Uh, it was, the community felt so strongly about this that they decided to rename the point. So uh, previously, before being known as Pigeon Point, this area was known as Punta de las Ballenas, which means whale point. Uh, after the wreck of the Carrier Pigeon, they decided to name it Carrier Pigeon Point, and then eventually it was just shortened to Pigeon Point. So we don't have any pigeons here, usually. Um, there weren't any historically, we do have a few now. But uh, that isn't why this place is called Pigeon Point, it's because of the wreck of the Carrier Pigeon. So after the wreck of the Carrier Pigeon in 1853, there's such a large community outcry uh, that the federal government decides, yes, we do need to build a lighthouse somewhere along that stretch of coast. So there's some argument that goes back and forth between whether the lighthouse should be built here at Pigeon Point or down at Año Nuevo, just to the south of us. Uh, there is some debate as to which light would be more important for sailors to help navigate. In the meantime, <clears throat> In the early 1860s, so this debate has gone on for quite some time, and in the early 1860s something happens here in the U.S. that sort of distracts the federal government from building lighthouses out on the west coast. I'll give you a second to think about what it might have been. It's the Civil War. So unfortunately the federal government is a little bit distracted over on the east uh, coast of the U.S., uh, so they don't have a lot of time and resources to pay for lighthouses to be built on the West Coast. So this project gets sort of put by the wayside. Unfortunately, in the meantime, in 1865, the uh, Sir John Franklin wrecks here at the point and about 13 people die. So it wrecks just south of where we are right now in Pigeon Point. Um, so 13 people die in that wreck. The next year, the Koya wrecks, um, not too far from where we are right now, and 26 people die. And then in 1868, about three years later, uh, the Hellas Point wrecks and 11 people die. So in total, in these three years, we have three shipwrecks and 50 people die, right pretty much where we are right now at Pigeon Point. So after the third wreck in 1868, uh, a local journalist in San Mateo puts out an article saying, I guess we'll just never get a, sh a lighthouse here uh, at Pigeon Point and ships will continue to wreck and things will continue to go wrong. And that gets the federal government's attention. The Civil War has ended at this point and they go, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's not, that's not true. And so Congress appropriates $90,000 for a lighthouse to be built here at Pigeon Point. Uh, and construction begins in 1870. So this wreck behind me though is actually from the Point Arena, which wrecked here in 1913. So well after the lighthouse had been built. And just to kind of take a quick tangent for a minute, because it is an interesting story. So uh, Pigeon Point was home for a commercial uh, wharf operation for quite some time. So uh, there was a local lumber operation in the area as well. So there was a ship moored here, the Point Arena, that had been a long-standing successful uh, 
cargo ship. It had been taking lumber and other supplies back and forth along the coast for, for many, many, many years. So they're moored here at Pigeon Point, picking up some lumber from a local operation, uh, when suddenly, while they're moored, one of the ropes wraps around their propeller, rips the propeller off of the ship. The ship, now being unable to steer themselves, wrecks right on the rocks, right next to the lighthouse, maybe, you know, not a hundred feet off of shore. So pretty close. Nobody dies, luckily, but the ship is again a total loss. Um, the local community, seeing the ship wrecked right next to the lighthouse, says, you know, that doesn't look so great, having a wrecked ship right next to a lighthouse. So they burn it down to the water line. So they burn it completely. Uh, this piece right here actually washed ashore at Año Nuevo, just to the south of us, 70 years later. It was discovered in 1983, this whole wreck. It's quite a big piece. It was put on display at Año Nuevo for uh, quite some time. Uh, luckily for us, they did some redesign of their trails there, which took the trail away from the Point Arena wreck. So they very generously donated it back to us here at Pigeon Point Light Station for us to put on display. So now it's been brought back home to where it wrecked originally. All right, so if you want to follow me, we'll move on and talk about how the Pigeon Point Lighthouse Tower was built. So let's go. All right, so as I mentioned at our last stop, uh, in 1870, Congress appropriated $90,000 for Pigeon Point Light Station to be built. So construction begins in 1871, the following year, and things move along fairly quickly at first. So things like the Fog Signal Building, which you can see behind me right here. This is actually a, a newer structure, the original burned down fairly quickly after a few, about a decade after it was originally built. But the Fog Signal Building was built. The Carpenter Shop, which I believe is that building right here was built pretty quickly and then the keepers quarters so this is kind of an edge of one of the newer keepers quarters now but the original was a four apartment victorian uh, that was built fairly quickly so those four structures were built uh, fairly rapidly the fog signal building actually went into operation in september of 1871 and um, but that was because these buildings were made out of wood so it's a little bit easier to put them together the lighthouse tower on the other hand ran into a few more issues let's say so originally, so as we can, I don't know if you can tell, but the uh, tower is made not out of wood and neither is the little office at the base, it's made out of brick. So the bricks were made locally, we think most likely in Pescadero. Uh, I'll give you a couple seconds if you wanna take a guess at home about how many bricks do you think it took to build the lighthouse tower? It's a lot. It's about 500,000 bricks were needed to make this tower, it's quite a few. So they actually got started on construction. They were putting the, the tower together when an inspector came by, took a look at the bricks and said, no, no, those aren't good enough. We need what's called city bricks. So they dismantled what had already been built, sent all 500,000 bricks back to Pescadero to be re-kilned, had to wait for all 500,000 to be brought back before they can start rebuilding the tower again. So it took quite a lot of work. Now, as we can also see, if you look kind of all the way up at the top, all the way up there, you'll see what looks like some iron. So that's cast iron. Um, that was all made by an ironworks company in San Francisco. So that helped all be brought over as well. So this is the second issue that they ran into. They've got all the brickwork together and now they're assembling the iron staircase that goes inside. So there's an iron spiral staircase inside the tower. As they're putting that together, um, they're having some issues. They can't quite get the stairs to fit. No matter which way they try to assemble that staircase, they can't get the pieces to fit. And they're thinking to themselves, what did those people in San Francisco do? Why don't their staircases work? So they stop construction, they go up to San Francisco, get an employee from the ironworks company, bring them all the way back down, which takes quite a long time because remember, Highway 1 doesn't exist yet. And so the fastest way to get up to San Francisco from Pigeon Point is by ship. So they go up to San Francisco, get an ironworks employee, bring them back down and they go, What's wrong with your staircase? We have tried every way imaginable to put this thing together and the pieces do not fit. What's going on here? And the ironworks company takes a look at the staircase. He takes a look at the uh, construction crew and he goes, well, haven't you ever painted by numbers? And turns out all of the pieces in the stairs are numbered. So what's important to know is our tower is conical. It's wider at the base than it is at the top. This is for structural stability. So the stairs need to be assembled in a particular order because that staircase gets more tightly coiled as you go up to the top of the lighthouse. So all of the pieces are numbered in a particular order. So all of the stairs in the first 
half spiral up to the first landing are all numbered one, the second half spiral are all numbered two, and so on as you go up the tower. Um, so luckily they were able to get that put together as well. And finally, in November uh, of 1872, Pigeon Point Lighthouse was lit for the very first time. And it actually has been an active aid to navigation ever since then. So this November, it'll be 148 years since Pigeon Point Lighthouse was very first lit. And it's been continuously helping sailors navigate up and down the California coast ever since then. But if you want to follow me to our next stop, we'll talk about how lighthouses work and how Pigeon Point Lighthouses work uh, Pigeon Point Lighthouse works specifically. So let's go. So here we are in the Fog Signal Building here at Pigeon Point Light Station State Historic Park. So this is actually now our visitor center, which unfor unfortunately is still closed to the public. Uh, but luckily, since we're on a virtual tour, I can show you around inside. So as you can see behind me, this is the historic first order Fresnel lens that sat at the top of the lighthouse and helped mariners navigate up this stretch of coast for over a hundred years. And remember that it was lit for the very first time on November 15th, 1872. So almost 148 years ago. Now, before we talk more about how this lens worked, I wanna give you a little bit of background on how lighthouses have worked throughout history. So the very first lighthouse was in Alexandria, uh, and that would have most likely just been a large pyre, a large uh, wooden bonfire burning on top of a very, very tall tower. The next few lighthouses were pretty similar, uh, a similar sort of bonfire or pyre on top of a tall tower along the Nile in Egypt. After that, they moved to trying coal, which burns a little bit brighter, um, but wood and coal both have similar issues. Um, they smoke quite a bit, so you can't enclose them in a glass dome, which means they're exposed to the elements. So things like wind and rain can put the fires out fairly quickly, and they're not that bright, so you can't see them from very far, which is the main point of a lighthouse. So after that, they tried a bunch of candles on a sort of chandelier style. Um, that worked in terms of preventing a lot of smoke buildup, so you could enclose it, protecting it from the elements, but still, it wasn't very bright at all. So the next step in lighthouse uh, technology was what's called a parabolic reflector. So here's what one looks like. So you can see it's just uh, an oil lamp that sits in sort of a metal bowl here. And so the way that this works is that metal bowl has been polished to the point where it reflects some of that light that's coming out from the back of a light source. Uh, it reflects it back in, the, in, a, in a direction towards C, if that makes sense. So uh, light comes out in sort of a 360 every single direction. So the parabolic reflector reflects some of that light back out, not all of it. So it's, it's a better step forward, but it's still not very effective. And you would need so many of these parabolic reflectors stacked together that it would end up looking like this in order to make use of this. So you can see just how many of these reflectors were stacked together in this apparatus just to make a light bright enough that, could, that it could be seen out to sea. And this required a lot of maintenance from lighthouse keepers. They had to fill each and every single one of these lamps. So each of these metal reflectors has a lamp inside of it. And each of these reflectors needed to be polished and cleaned very, very frequently. So they were very high maintenance and still not very bright. So in the early 1800s, Napoleon hired a French physicist by the name of Augustin Fresnel to invent a better light for their lighthouses. He said, I want you to make a brighter light that can be seen further out to sea by our ships. And so Augustin Fresnel thought to himself, well, instead of making a brighter light, so instead of making the light source itself brighter, why don't I just make better use of the light source that we already have? So why don't I try and capture more of that light to make better use of it? And that's what he did. He invented the Fresnel lens. So he finalized his designs in 1822, almost 200 years ago. And in fact, he did such a good job of capturing that light and redirecting it that there are still lighthouses in the world today that use a Fresnel lens as what we call the active aid to navigation. So there are still Fresnel lenses in use today helping ships navigate up and down their particular stretch of coast. That's how amazing and effective they are. So the way that a Fresnel lens works, you can see we have all of these prisms right here. So this is what we call prisms. And then this stretch right here it's called a lens. So it's made up of prisms and lenses. The way that it works is by concentrating, 
reflecting and refracting light in a single direction. So as you can see, we've got our light source here. Remember that light comes out in every possible direction. So if we take this beam, for example, this light beam, it's coming up in this direction, and without the prism there, it would continue to go up, 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 up in this direction and just stretch out and wouldn't be much use to a ship. But as this light beam comes up, it hits this prism, is redirected and sent in a parallel direction as all the other beams that are being brought out from this light source. So as you can see, all of these light beams are being sent out in a singular direction. Now, there are three types of Fresnel lenses. So the first one is this one in the middle. This is called a fixed lens. So this lens just produces a steady glow in 360 degrees, and it's called fixed because it doesn't move. So if you can see on this pedestal right here, there's no mechanisms that we'll talk about in a second here. So this lens is designed to just sit there and produce a steady glow of light. The next type of Fresnel lens, which is what our type is, is called a rotating lens, which as I'm sure you can guess what that means. So here's what a rotating lens looks like, or the one right behind us. So it sits on a pedestal with a little box right here, and this lens was designed to rotate. So fixed lenses have this sort of prism uh, situation right here. So they don't have what we call a bullseye lens in the middle, like you can see right here. So this is called a bullseye. So this lens produces a steady glow all the way around it. The rotating lenses produce beams of light. So if you imagine the spokes on a bike wheel, that's what this lens looks like when it's lit up. So you can actually, if I rotate, if I move our camera really quickly, I can actually show you the beams of light around the room right now, because we have a little light bulb in here, and I turned it on for you. So if we move our camera over this way really quickly, you can see there is a beam of light right here. You can see there's a beam of light right there. There's another beam of light right there. And there's another beam of light right there. So these are all beams of light being produced by our lens from our light source inside of it. So it produces beams of light like a spokes on a bike wheel and it's designed to rotate. We'll talk about how that works in a minute. The third type is called a uh, fixed varied with a flash. So it's basically a combination of the two. And that looks like this one over here. So it produces both a steady glow and also rotates. So uh, the rotating lenses were designed to flash. So the fixed lenses just produce, as I said, a steady glow that can be seen out to sea. The rotating lenses produce what is seen as a flash out to sea. So the way that this works, we're gonna do some math here. So our lens has 24 of these bullseye panels. So 24 of these panels that you can see right here. Now our lens rotates at a speed of about one complete rotation every four minutes. So if we do some math, four minutes is about 240 seconds. 240 seconds divided by 24 flash panels means that every 10 seconds, one of these panels will pass in line with you. So again, remember that this produces beams of light kind of like spokes on a bike wheel. So if you're out to sea, as one of these beams passes you, you'll see a flash of light. And then another 10 seconds will pass and another beam will pass you and you'll see another flash of light and then it'll keep moving. So that's how these lenses produce what's called a flash pattern. So the fixed varied has a steady glow that also flashes intermittently. So the timing in between flashes is determined both by the speed at which the lens rotates and the number of flash panels that it has. These are the number of these bullseye lenses here. So again, our lens rotates at a speed of about once every four minutes. It's got 24 of these flash uh, panels or bullseye lenses. So our lighthouse has what we call a flash characteristic of one light flash every 10 seconds. And that has been our flash characteristic for the 148 years that our lighthouse has been in operation, which is pretty unique. So speaking of flash characteristics, every single lighthouse has a unique flash characteristic. And this is what sailors would use at sea to tell them what lighthouse specifically they were looking at. And that would help them navigate up and down the California coast. So again, if you saw one white flash every 10 seconds, you would know that you were looking at Pigeon Point Lighthouse specifically. If you saw one red flash every six seconds, 
that meant that you were looking at Año Nuevo Lighthouse. So lights could be colored, and the timing in between flashes in combination would be that flash characteristic that you could use to tell what lighthouse you were looking at. Now, the way that this lens rotated was by a clockwork mechanism. So remember that our lighthouse was built in 1872, before electricity existed. So as I showed you in that photo, you can see on our rotating lenses, there's a little box right here. So in that box is a bunch of gears that are then connected to, as you can see right there, what are called chariot wheels. So imagine these big wheels that sit below this pedestal. And as these gears rotate, these chariot wheels rotate, which then in turn rotates the entire Fresnel lens. This Fresnel lens, by the way, is a first order. It weighs 2,000 pounds. So first order just means largest size. This is the biggest they come, weighs 2,000 pounds. It's over 10 feet tall. It's huge. Um, I'm standing pretty close to the camera, so if I were to stand right next to this thing, it would make me look really tiny. So how did these gears move, though? Because again, we don't have electricity, so they couldn't just flip a switch, have the gears rotate, and start rotating this thing right here. So it rotated by what's called a clockwork mechanism. So attached to this little uh, mechanism here was a cable that ran the length of the tower, ran the length of the tower. At the bottom of that cable was an 80 pound weight. Now as that weight pulled the cable, that cable pulled the gears, rotating them, which again then rotated those chariot wheels, which in turn rotated this 2,000 pound lens. Now, it took about four hours for our weight to reach the full movement. So to, to go from the very top of its movement down to the very bottom, it fell about 25 feet. It took four hours. At the end of that four hours, a poor lighthouse keeper would have to crank that weight up to the top of its movement so that it could fall back down again. And they did that every four hours at nighttime when the light was lit. Now, luckily, a lighthouse keeper shift was only four hours long. So you only had to do it once per shift. Now, the original light source for our Fresnel lens, because again, this is before electricity, was a lard oil lamp. So a lot of people think whale oil was used. At this point in history, whale oil was much too expensive because whales had been hunted to near extinction. So they switched to lard oil, which is basically just pig fat. It's much less expensive, it's, in, uh, it's easier to find, and remember, they have to supply it for all the lighthouses in the U.S., which there are quite a few of. So it was an eight foot tall lard oil lamp. So they would fill it up here at the top. It would then sit down here. And then this is the focal plane. So it would have a bunch of wicks, five wicks and a concentric ring about that thick, pretty big. Um, and that was the first light source. So that was from 1872 to 1888. In 1888, they switched to kerosene, which is much more explosive and volatile, but it burns more cleanly and more brightly. They used that until about 1912. And then they switched to what's called an incandescent oil vapor lamp, uh, or an IOV. Uh, and if you remember those old Coleman lamps that you could get for camping and you had to pump them up really hard to get the gas uh, to brighten up the lamp, it's just that, but larger. And then finally, in 1926, they switched to electricity. They got a thousand watt bulb in there, and all they had to do was flip a switch, and it's on. Pretty easy. Um, then in the 1970s, so the, the lighthouse had been operated by quite a few different governmental organizations over history. It had changed hands from the Lighthouse Bureau to the Lighthouse Association quite a few times. Uh, eventually, the Coast Guard took over uh, in the early 1900s. In the 1970s, they decided that they were going to automate the lighthouses. And so our lighthouse was automated in 1972. They switched to a small automated light. And since then, the Fresnel lens wasn't considered the active aid to navigation anymore. It still sat at the top of the lighthouse tower, but it wasn't used every night. The automated light was. And that made things a lot easier. Today, our automated light is about a five-gallon drum. drum. It's about, about the size of a five-gallon drum. It's about this big. It makes one white flash every 10 seconds. It operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you're ever driving past Pigeon Point, especially when it's dark, uh, and you watch the lighthouse, you'll see one white flash every 10 seconds. All right, so if you want to follow me, we'll go outside and talk about what's going on at Pigeon Point right now. All right, so here we are on the back deck here at Pigeon Point where we'll finish up our virtual tour today. Uh, I just want to finish to talking about uh, what's going on at Pigeon Point Light Station right now. So as I uh, finished at our last stop, the lighthouse was automated in, the 19, in 1972. And since then, the automated light, which you can see right there, has been in use uh, since then, so since 1972. So our lighthouse is still an active aid to navigation. 
Um, now in 2001, we had a pretty big storm come through here at the light station. Um, and maintaining a light station takes a lot of work. Let me just put that out there now. Um, being a lighthouse keeper was a very, very busy job. They had a lot of tasks that they had to do on a regular basis. They had to clean and maintain everything on the ground. So they were very, very busy constantly. Now in 2001, we had a pretty big storm come through the light station. The tower hadn't been properly maintained over the years. And during this storm, the belt course, which is right here. Now, I want you to imagine the belt course as a metal rubber band that sits around the tower. That belt course had rusted over the years. So during this large storm, it swelled with water, cracked, broke, and fell. And it took two 300 pound chunks of brick with it. So about 600 pounds of masonry and iron fell in that storm in 2001. Now, it's important to remember that our tower has no structural stabilization whatsoever. There are no steel beams, no rebar. It is just brick and mortar, 148 year old brick and mortar. So that iron belt course that cracked and fell in 2001, remember it acts like a metal rubber band. So when intact, I want you to imagine the tower as a stack of pencils that you've held in your hands. That belt course is a rubber band you put around the stack of pencils. When you put that stack of pencils upright and you let it go, they stand, they're freestanding. But when that rubber band snaps, what happens to the pencils? They fall. So that's exactly what's liable to happen after that belt course has broken. So we were able to put some mesh banding up over it. Um, but we, since then, 2001, the lighthouse tower has been closed to the public. I'm sure you've noticed in some of our other previous shots today that there's been a fence around the tower to protect people just in case any other pieces of that belt course and brick decide to fall. Luckily, fingers crossed, none of them have so far. Um, so we've been waiting nearly 20 years. We've been very hopeful that we've been able, that we would be able to eventually fix this lighthouse tower. And luckily for us, last July, the state of California appropriated $9 million for us to put to use to fix the lighthouse tower. So that money will be put to use on the top third, top third of the lighthouse tower. Uh, we're hoping to start construction sometime next year. We need an additional seven to nine million to finish the restoration because we've got to do some work down towards the base of the tower and on the interior. Um, but we're very excited that that nine million will be put to use uh, fixing the structural urgent damage up near the top. So remember that Pigeon Point has a story of tragedy, hope, and innovation. The tragedy of the multiple shipwrecks that happened here all the way beginning with the, the carrier pigeon in 1853. Uh, multiple shipwrecks, the innovation of the Fresnel lens up at the top, that innovative technology that's been used for over two, almost 200 years since its inception in the early 1820s, and hope. So the people of Pescadero and the local communities hoped for a lighthouse to be built after that very first shipwreck, nearly 20 years in 1853. And we here at Parks have been hoping for nearly another 20 years for the lighthouse to be restored. Um, thank you so much for joining us on our virtual tour today. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about our park and seeing around the grounds here. If you want to learn more about our park and hear more about its story, including about the whales that live here, what it was like to be a lighthouse keeper, more details on the many, many shipwreck that happens have happened here, check out our Facebook page at Pigeon Point Lighthouse. Um, we've got lots of videos uh, detailing what it looks like at the top of the tower, what it looks like on the inside, and many, many more. Uh, if you feel like you'd like to make a donation to help us restore the lighthouse tower, check out Coastside State Parks Association. Uh, they are our cooperating nonprofit. Um, you can make a donation to them that will go directly to our park to help restore it. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.